Now, um, pretty much every formula you're going to see now for the whole course, the temperature must be in kelvins. Temperature must be in kelvins. However, um, the problem will very, very often give you temperatures in Celsius and test whether you can think to translate it into Kelvin. So this is a, a trick that uh, physics teachers never get tired of. They always think it's hilarious to give you the temperature in Celsius and see whether you're going to translate it into Kelvin. So we have to look uh, for the opportunity to do that. Uh, now, actually, there is one situation when you don't have to translate. Uh, so let's take a look at here. Let's say that somebody changed their temperature from freezing to boiling. Well, what would be the delta T if you go from freezing to boiling in Celsius? What's the delta T in Celsius here? And what's the delta T in Kelvin? So the one time when you don't have to translate from Celsius to Kelvin is when the formula has a delta T. And the reason you don't have to translate is you just get the same answer anyway. Delta T, the change in temperature, is the same in Celsius and Kelvin. So you can save yourself a step and give yourself less chances to make an arithmetic mistake by not translating the temperatures in that case. So if the formula has a T in it, well, this is the level of temperature, and then you have to use Kelvins, because the level of the temperature is always different in Celsius and Kelvin. But if the formula has a delta T in it, well, it doesn't matter whether you use Celsius or Kelvins, because we just saw you get the same number either way. If you go to all the trouble of translating into Kelvins, you'd still get the del same delta T as before, so why bother? So if a formula involves delta T, you can use either Kelvins or Celsius. All right, so we're going to see a bunch of formulas now for the rest of the course. Some of them involve T and some involve delta T. Well, if they involve T, we've got to translate into Kelvins. But if they involve delta T, it doesn't make any difference because it would be the same number either way. And again, I don't think you're really going to be using Fahrenheit, so we won't worry about that. Okay. Now, we haven't said what the temperature means in terms of our cardboard box analogy. Um, when something gets hotter, what's actually happening to the molecules? When something gets hotter, what's actually happening to the molecules? Well, it's really not obvious what's happening to it. It was, a, it was a big discovery in physics when they actually figured out what makes things hot. And it turns out that when things get hot, that really means that the molecules have more kinetic energy. The temperature is really just our way of perceiving the kinetic energy. Uh, to be more precise, the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. So this would be the best way to write that. This is the symbol for proportional, because the temperature doesn't equal the energy, but it's proportional. They can't be equal because they're in different units. Energy is in joules and temperature is in kelvins, but they can be proportional. If you double the temperature, that means you've doubled the average kinetic energy. This bar here is for average, if you've seen bars used for average. So the temperature is the average kinetic energy of the molecules. All right, this is uh, still actually um, uh, a little bit roughly speaking. It's a little more subtle than this, but this is good enough for our purposes for right now. We can say the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. Um, and, and how do you increase the kinetic energy of something? What does it mean if they have more kinetic energy? Um, there's more rapid motions. Versus... They're moving faster, basically. So the kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So basically, the temperature is measuring how fast the molecules are moving. So if it feels to you um, like uh, a room is warming up, what's really happening is that the molecules are moving faster inside the room. Uh, that's really not obvious, but it was uh, uh, a discovery that was made in the 1800s that temperature is actually um, the, related to the speed that the molecules are moving at. Uh, when it feels like things are getting hotter, that's really because the molecules are moving faster, more kinetic energy. So let's figure out what the impact of an increase in temperature would be on the pressure. Sounds right. Sounds like you're already figuring that out. Why would an increase in temperature increase the pressure? Um, uh, an increase in temperature, there is an increase in kinetic energy, which um, means that the molecules are uh, moving at a faster rate. So there is more collisions, and that will increase the pressure. OK. Yeah, that sounds perfect to me. The pressure comes from when the molecules collide with the sides of the box. Well, if they're moving faster, they're going to collide with the sides of the box more often. And I guess they'd also collide more forcefully as well. So for both of those reasons, an increase in temperature would increase the pressure. Uh, in fact, if you double the temperature, you would double the pressure. 
So where should I put the temperature in this equation to show that there's a direct relationship here between T and P? The right hand side? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. If we hold V and N constant, mm -hmm. if we increase T, well, now we'd be forced to increase P to make the equation still true. Remember that when we're looking at the relationship, we should imagine holding the other variables constant. So that was right. What this tells us is, uh, and this is, uh, okay, so this is telling us these relationships. All right, and now it turns out that there's also an extra constant here. And this is a equation you might have seen before, the ideal gas law. This is so important. Um, that it's not good enough just to memorize this. We really need to understand it a little bit. So we've gone through and understood all the basic portions here. Now we see, we understand why V should be on the same side as P and N and T should be on opposite sides. Because when you increase the volume, you have fewer collisions and a smaller pressure. But if you increase the number of particles or the speed that they're moving at, you have more collisions and a greater pressure. So that's all really the ideal gas law is telling us here. So here we have our ideal gas law. And this will be one of our key equations for the rest of the course, which is why uh, we wanted to understand it as well as uh, looking at it here. R is just what's called the universal gas constant. And you could look up the value of R in your inside front cover. There's the value of R in the inside front cover. I don't know if we'll need that right now, or you can look it up. All right, but if you need that, you can look that up here. One important thing is, all gases have the same R. That's why this is called the universal gas constant. So you know, sometimes you have to look up in a table different numbers for different substances. But you don't need to look up a different gas constant for helium and for hydrogen and for nitrogen. Um, all gases have the same R. That's why it's the universal gas constant. Now, gases don't always obey this law. They only obey it, obey it when they're acting like ideal gases. But that's usually what you're going to focus on in this course. We'll usually assume that the gas is behaving ideally. So then we can use our ideal gas law. Okay, so that gives us uh, the ideal gas a lot here. Now, in your homework, you actually you were not actually assigned any problems where you would just plug into this equation. Um, so we have to keep working here before we can see the techniques you would need for the homework. Um, there's basically uh, two different types of problems you can do with the ideal gas law. You can do one situation problems and you can do two situation problems. One situation problems and two situation problems. For example, suppose I tell you that the volume is 5 cubic meters and N is 3 moles and the temperature is 300 and 98 Kelvin, and I ask you for the pressure. Well, uh, this should be straightforward enough that maybe we won't actually work through this. But the point here is you would just plug into the formula, right? You would just plug into the formula. Everything's already in standard units. You'd have to do a little bit of algebra because you have to get the P by itself in the formula. But you just plug in. You would plug in 5 for V, 3 for N. You would look up R in your inside front cover, and you would look up 398 and put that in for T. And then you do a little algebra to figure out P. Now, this is what I would call a one situation problem, because we just described one situation here. OK, so for a one situation problem, you just plug into the formula. The one thing to watch out for is if any of these had not been standard units, we would have to translate them into standard units before we could plug them into the formula. But you didn't actually get any homework problems like that, so maybe you won't get into that right now. Instead, let's see how to do two situation problems, because that's what your homework was about.